Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Hard Truths Podcast. I'm excited to be here. This is your host, Ashton Forbes. Thank you, everybody, for being here with me. Today, I have guest Tom Montauk. Very excited to talk to him. He's an author of Montauk.net. Uh, he's uh, written three books, Fringe Knowledge for Beginners, Discerning the Alien Disinformation, and Gnosis. He is an undergraduate, who, or he was an undergraduate who studied physics and electrical engineering. And since then, he has been pursuing independent research in scalar physics and suppressed inventions. He is also an experiencer who's networked with hundreds of other experiencers and researchers to get to the bottom of the paranormal and alien phenomenon. So without further ado, let's welcome Tom to the stage. Hey, Tom, how's it going today, man? Hey, it's going great. Let me get my light out here out of the way. There we uh, go. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for being yeah. here with me today. Thanks for talking. Uh, I'm excited for this. I'm excited to do a little bit of science conversation and then dig into a little bit of the, the paranormal side, too, and get your thoughts on everything that's been going on in, in the world and then what have you. Yeah, sounds good. So I guess first where I wanted to start, like get straight into the science, which is scalar physics. So I've been recently researching scalar physics myself. I have this big list of science topics to look into related to electrical engineering and scalar physics was on there. And when I started digging into, it, I found out about a guy named uh, Thomas Bearden and started watching his presentations. And actually, before I even got to that, I was just Googling on YouTube and who did i find there i found your video mm -hmm. and this was before i knew who you were at all and I, and I watched it and i went wow this is mind blowing to me and then i think you actually ended up replying to some people in the post that i made about it and then i realized oh you're tom Otak. you're the guy that made this actual video so uh we can show a little bit of the video but beforehand i kind of want to know what got you how did you find out about scalar physics what got you interested in it you know how did that play out for you in your life yeah, so basically for me, it started when I was 12 or 13 years old, when I started reading all the UFO books at my local library. And once I started digging into the UFO literature, I noticed that some abductees were describing the propulsion systems of these advanced aerospace vehicles, as that Kona Blue document refers to them. Uh, and so that really got me interested in how do these things even work? And it just so happened that I was reading Popular Science magazine at the time, and in the back of that magazine, there was a, an ad for Rex Research. And Rex Research throughout in Nevada, it's run by one guy. And he went through all the archives and old newspapers and everything. He started digging up all the suppressed, all these suppressed inventions. And he photocopied them and put them into uh, little information packets that he called infolios. So, I, down, so I, I ordered his catalog and then I ordered a ton of these infolios on everything from Wilhelm Reich to Townsend Brown to uh, the Eklund free energy generator, psychotronics, uh, you name it. I ordered dozens of these things and I was obsessed with them. I mean, I was reading them every day uh, throughout junior high and high school. So that really got me interested in alternative inventions. And I was doing a lot of experiments at the time with weather engineering, ergonomy, uh, I tried I tried to replicate the Eklund free energy generator, but mm -hmm. the tools that I had at the time really weren't what I needed to really make it efficient. I mean, it produced electricity, but it wasn't over unity because there was too much friction and air gaps in there and so on. Uh, and so when I when it was time to graduate high school, I, uh, I decided to go into physics and ele electrical engineering specifically mm -hmm. to get a get the mathematical framework that I needed to better understand how that all worked, you know, because I mean, it's one yeah. thing to understand it conceptually, but if you want to actually build it and apply it, you do have to know the math, you know, just like a mechanic has to know the specific routing of all the electrical circuits in an engine in order to, you know, work on it. So it's the same thing here. And uh, so I went to college, I did physics, I did four years of undergrad, and then my scholarships ran out and I realized, you know what, I don't want to continue on that track into academia because I was working with grad students at the time. I was working in, in the actual, uh, I was working in the plasma physics lab at the University of Iowa with my professor, and uh, I was winding these huge coils for the, the for the plasma machine. So it's like a, it's, it generates an intense uh, magnetic field, like so strong that if you're in the same room and you hold like a metal wrench in the hand, even like 20 yards away, that wrench will get pulled out of your hand. That's how strong. Really? Yeah, yeah. So you had to keep all metal objects away from these things when they're running. And uh, but anyway, so I I was more of a technician. You know, it's not like I was actually designing the equations or you know how the how the plasma worked at the time because I was only an undergrad but it did give me some exposure to academia you know the politics of it and I worked with grad students and I saw you know the kind of hoops that they had to jump through in order to uh, get approved for certain lines of research and even my plasma physics professor at the time 
I think he was working on something that wasn't officially approved in the sense that he said that, oh, we're just studying nonlinear waves and plasmas. But in his back right pocket, he always carried the New Testament, a little pocket version of the New Testament. So he, he was a devout Christian working on this yeah. stuff. And when you get into nonlinear plasma phenomenon, to me, I got the impression he was looking for signs of life in the plasma. Really? Mm -hmm. He never said it outright, but just putting everything together, I think that's secretly what he was doing, and you know, which is a smart move because you can't really try to get funding for that. <laughs> you know, you can't get a grant from the government for uh, you know trying to trying to find life in plasmas. I mean, that's that's sort of a two out there. You, you'd lose your reputation if you did that. So, have you ever have you read Joseph P. Farrell's stuff or anything about the idea of you know sentient plasma? What is your thoughts on that? I think it's possible because, in a way, uh, you know, a lot of the Soviet scientists who studied the human aura, the human biofield, they called it a bioplasma because they assumed that it was uh, sort of an, an electrical charged field that penetrated the body and was also around the body. And from what I remember, some of them theorized that it, it consisted of delocalized electrons. In other words, charges that were in a quantum superposition state all over the body. And this quantum superposition state uh, allowed these electrons to respond to things from outside of space-time. Okay. Hmm. Uh, and actually, if you look into Stuart Hameroff and Roger Penrose's work on consciousness, they also theorize that within cells, there are these structures, as you might know, called microtubules. And these microtubules, uh, they're like these really, they're like nanotubes, essentially, but they're living nanotubes. And they're made of these little things called dimers. Okay. And inside the dimer, there's a, there's a little pocket where delocalized electrons exist. Okay. So it's, it's an electron that's not in a, a specific state. It's in a superposition state. It's quantum sensitive. And that somehow allows it to tap into consciousness, non-local consciousness, in order to translate that non-local consciousness's um, intentions or thoughts or whatever into physical biochemical form, neural form, you know, activating neurons and so on. Okay, so there's there's something about quantum delocalized electrons that seems to be to be sensitive to metaphysical fields, I guess you could call it. So that, that's my thoughts on that. So do you think that's a really interesting thought is your belief? I guess the bigger question I'm going to ask you is what is your belief on, you know, why we exist at all? But I mm -hmm. guess what I'm wondering is, would you agree or disagree with the idea that we are like avatars that are having like consciousness kind of beamed into us? Or what's your thought on that? Yeah, I think so. Because the people who say that consciousness is merely an epiphenomenon of matter, they're what they're, what they're saying is that matter is primary. And if that were the case, then you should be able to um, predict everything that matter would do, like an electron or subatomic particle. You should be able to predict, you know, down to the nanosecond what it's going to do next. Because, I mean, if it's just matter, then it's ultimately just billiard balls hitting other billiard balls, right? So if you know all the initial conditions, if you know the nature of the system, you can predict its future outcome. And that's what's called determinism, because it's the cause determining the effect. But once quantum physics came, came along, it was proven both experimentally and mathematically by by von Neumann and uh, some others that that cannot be that that cannot be the case. That at the quantum level, uh, non-determinism, in other words, unpredictability, is baked into it, and there is really no way to fully 100% predict everything about a quantum system. So, you know, physicists with all their technology, all their mathematics, they cannot predict what an electron will do next with 100% precision. Because there's always something else. There's always something else that is non-physical, you know, that's non-deterministic, that inf influences its behavior. And so when you think about the human brain, or, you know, all life in general, uh, be being involved with these microtubules and delocalized electrons, well, there you go, there's your answer. That That's the answer as to what is causing these electrons to move in an unpredictable way. And not just electrons, but photons too, you know, other subatomic particles. So in other words, as much as physics wants to boil everything down to an equation, once you get down to quantum to the quantum level, the only thing that they can really do there is statistics. They can mm -hmm. only do statistics because they don't know specifically what one thing will do, but they know generally what a bunch of things will do or a bunch of measurements will result in, right? So it, it starts becoming fuzzier, you know, more probabilistic, more indirect, and they can only talk in, in generalities usually. Yeah, that reminds me of the double slit experiment, you know, in terms of the wave function and the wave function breaking down this idea of deterministic versus probabilistic. I think that mm -hmm. was my first introduction to um quantum mechanics in general the first time i looked at it, when i went well that's weird that doesn't make any <laughs> sense 
Right. Did you have a similar revelation ever in your life where you thought quantum mechanics is kind of maybe the secret to understanding a lot of this stuff? Yeah, it sort of dawned on me once I really got into it in college, you know, taking several semesters of quantum mechanics. Um, and also at the time, I remember I was walking downtown in Iowa City at the University of Iowa, and there was a Hare Krishna guy, you know, dressed in the orange you know, clothing and everything, and, and he was selling books. And I happened to walk by and he, and he uh, acquisitioned me and, he, and uh, I started talking to him and he was selling a book on quantum physics and consciousness. Okay, so I bought it. And that book kind of opened the door to me because it does get into the nitty gritty mechanics of how quantum physics could potentially tie into consciousness. Like where is it within that entire mathematical framework where consciousness would enter into it, you see? Uh, and you know, just to, just to kind of summarize that quickly, where consciousness enter into quantum physics is in determining or influencing the phase, the phase of the quantum wave function. In other words, how the waves are aligned with each other in, in, in a more general sense, okay? And consciousness seems to have an influence on that, and that's how it's able to get an inroads into the everyday world that we know here, which is like the macroscopic world as opposed to the quantum world. But, uh, you know, just like in chaos theory where a little tiny effect has a big effect, well, the quantum world consists of all these chaos theory butterflies, okay? And when consciousness influences one of those, it can cascade upwards and amplify upwards in scale until before you know it, you've got a living human being generating sounds, you know, in the form of language, for example, or, or a human being pressing the nuclear button and blowing up the entire world. That entire thing boils down to what's happening at that little tiny quantum level, mm. you see? The little tiny quantum level and because that's where things are sensitive enough that something from outside of space time can enter into it and influence everything that follows from that hmm. interesting i like that thought and uh, it does make me wonder about consciousness in general and i think i want to ask more about that a little later but i guess one more question before we dig into the si the scalar physics would be mm -hmm. uh do you think that there is uh any um incompatibility between let's say faith and science what, what's your view on, on how faith because you were talking about you know your professor that you know, has the Bible in their back pocket and then they're doing, you know, plasma, advanced mm -hmm. plasma research. Well, what is your thoughts on that? Well, I think faith begins where science ends because mm -hmm. science doesn't know everything. Uh, science likes to put one foot in front of the other, you know, in order to get to the next step, you have to be able to calculate it. You have to know the certainty of it. And like, it's logic, you know, it's logic that follows from certain premises, certain observations. And it goes forward and forward and forward and forward uh, down the line of reasoning but at some point you're gonna hit a dead end because in order to get to the next step, uh, you need luck, essentially. If you think about it, there, I mean, there's so many scientists throughout history who got stuck at a certain point and they didn't know how to, how to proceed. And then they would have a dream that tells them what the answer is, or they would have a synchronicity or some, some opportunity, they stumble across some book or they make some insight by accident, some observation by accident, okay? Hmm. Those things, they don't they're those things are non-deterministic they're not something that you can reason yourself to words or necessarily you know crunch your way towards with more and more experiments you know s certain things are just synchronistic and i think that's where i think that's where the hidden hand of god or consciousness or higher consciousness reveals itself in these in these mm -hmm. tiny moments that change the future forever you know when you hit that impasse of logic and matter and experimentation and data five senses you hit that impasse in order to jump across you have to have what you have to have a leap of faith the leap of faith to take a chance do the experiment you know you don't know if it's going to work out you have to have faith that it's going to and you do it and then you find out whether it's correct or not you see so i think i mean they're not incompatible they're just uh they occupy different domains of human experience and they both have to work together well you're already blowing my mind <laughs> because the way you thought of the way you phrased that i thought wow that's almost like the difference between the the wave function and the deterministic it's mm -hmm. like well, where when it breaks down like maybe that's the essence of faith itself where it's like we haven't figured out what the future is but once it's been determined now you have something that's tangible and uh that you can touch um right so i think what i want to do is I'm, i have this i kind of so like i said at the beginning of this i found you because i found your youtube channel found your description of scalar physics i read it or watched it blew my mind i actually went and edited it down um right after that because i was like okay i gotta show people this and uh so i think i want to play the shortened version i have i think it maybe is like three or four minutes Okay. Um, and then get your reaction to it. And if I missed anything in there as well, then have you kind of weigh in. 
And then I'm going to ask you probably some more questions on the scalar physics stuff because I just think it's the scalar physics thing is honestly blow my mind. Um, feels like it's science that's out there that nobody even realized was existed. Um, so I think we have quite a bit to talk it about. It says that, that the gravitation. Let me uh, restart that. Let's do this. Okay. Yeah. How long is this? Oh, okay. It's only about three minutes. Here we go. The postulate says that the gravitational potential arises when there is a divergence in the magnetic vector potential and when the electric scalar potential changes with time in a curl-free way. Let's break those down. So normally, as we discussed, the magnetic vector potential curls into a magnetic force field. But when it doesn't curl, and instead diverges or converges, that's what scalar physics says produces a gravitational potential. Divergence of the magnetic vector potential is key. Divergence is a math term meaning that there is some kind of expansion or compression in the field. In other words, the field vectors point away from or towards a common center. And that's the opposite of curl, which involves the field circulating around something rather than converging or diverging from it. As for the electric scalar potential, that can also create a gravitational potential under certain conditions. Normally, as explained, the electric scalar potential has a gradient that forms an electric force field. And if this electric field changes over time, then according to Maxwell's famous equations, you get a curling magnetic vector potential that produces a magnetic field. But what if the curl of the magnetic vector potential is suppressed or canceled out? What if you set things up so that the magnetic vector potential does not produce a magnetic field? A simple example of that for anyone curious would be a spherical capacitor with an oscillating electric field. Then what you get instead is a changing gravitational potential. So instead of a transverse electromagnetic wave, you would get what's called a longitudinal electrogravitational wave. Transverse means that the field wiggles side to side as it travels, which is what electromagnetism normally does. And longitudinal means that it compresses and expands in the direction of travel, which is what these artificial gravity waves do. I'm talking about things like ball lightning and exotic vacuum objects, the bifield brown effect, Tesla's wireless energy systems, longitudinal forces and rail guns, the exploding wire phenomenon, Stefan Marinov's magnetic ionization device, low energy nuclear reactions, plasma-based free energy systems. So with that one postulate that the magnetic vector potential and the electric scalar potential can each produce a gravitational potential under the right conditions, you open the door to Star Trek level technology. So there we go. That was amazing. It kind of blew my mind. Now, and I've been watching a little bit Thomas Beard and I'm not an expert on this at all. So my understanding is that when we're talking about... Um, like an electric field we're talking about like essentially a straight line when we're talking about a magnetic field we're talking about kind of a, a loop or a curve or curl as you would say and then when we're talking about the uh, potential gravitational field, we're talking about like the stress like squishing a ball back and forth um what, what am i how close am i on there and how can can you expand upon your video and, and understanding of how sca what scalar physics is and how it can lead to gravitational manipulation yeah, I'm glad that you played that video because it had the diagrams, it had the equations, and and trying to explain that without that and without a whiteboard is is very is very difficult. Right? I mean, you, you can do it in analogies and metaphors, but uh, it takes longer, and then the longer it takes, the, the more you wear out people's patience. So yeah. it, it's it's a trade off between being long and boring or short but complicated, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah but yeah, that that pretty much sums it up. Now, I think the the most important thing to understand is that which is what I said at the beginning of the video, which wasn't included in this particular edit, is that the everyday forces that we're familiar with, uh, we, we know magnetism, you know, you got magnets that stick on refrigerators. We know electricity when you turn on the lights or you, know, you get static electricity in your hair or your clothing, okay? And we know gravity, of course, because you know, it pulls us down. So these things, those are all force fields because they're fields that exert force on their respective type of matter, you know, whether it's an electric charge, whether it's a magnet or whether it's mass, you know, mass that gets pulled down by gravity. Okay, so these things is what we're familiar with. And all of our electronics technology, whether it's phones or radios or computers, uh, those follow from the principles of electrical engineering. And electrical engineering follows from the principles of electrodynamics, 
which is how electric and magnetic fields interact to create electromagnetic waves. Okay. So, but, but the problem with all of that is that it's only the surface level. It's, it only skims the surface of what, how reality actually works. So imagine, you know, you got waves on the ocean and imagine if you only ever paid attention to waves and you had no concept of the wind that's whipping up the waves or the underwater current that is steering the waves. If you have no concept of that and you only focus on the waves, then how much of reality do you actually understand? You don't. Mm -hmm. You only understand maybe how to how to use the waves to surf, for example, uh, but you don't know anything about how to create a sailboat to actually harvest the wind, <laughs> you know, or a submarine that can ha harvest the underwater currents. So there are technological applications that are not included under current modern day electrical engineering because the theories that electrical engineering is based on are incomplete. I wouldn't say that they're necessarily flawed. They're just incomplete. They've closed certain doors that they should not have closed. And this goes back to the mid to late 1800s. Because mm -hmm. in the early, the early 1800s, okay, the early 19th century, that's when people like, uh, like Ampere, for example, and some others were doing experiments with uh, the very earliest experiments with electricity. And some of them discovered that if you send electricity down a wire, it'll create a magnetic field that uh, alters a, a compass magnet, you know, the direction that the compass points. So they realized that there was a connection between magnets and lightning, essentially, which is mm. kind of crazy to think, like, how do, you, how do those things even connect? Well, smart people did experiments, and they figured out how everything behaved, and then they handed all that data over to the scientists and the mathematicians at the time, one of whom was James Clerk Maxwell. And he, he, was, he was a mathematical genius, you know, in a sense. Uh, and he took that data, and he figured out the rules by which electromag or electric and magnetic fields interact with each other and how ele electromagnetic waves are produced. Uh, and he also figured out that light, that light itself is half electricity and half magnetism that are kind of wrapped up together in the form of a photon. Well, although I actually at the time he didn't know about photons because that came a little bit later. But yeah, he, he realized, uh, he, he worked out the mathematics of, of how that all relates, okay? But while he was working out the math, there were certain avenues, certain doors, as I mentioned, that he could have opened. Um, but he thought to himself, well, as far as we know, uh, the ether, because they believed in the ether at the time, this medium that fills all of space. He said, well, I don't, th we, I don't think that the ether is elastic. It doesn't have elastic properties. So we can discount any sort of compression, like divergence, convergence. Because remember, mm -hmm. in that video, I talked about divergence and how you know, fields can converge and, or diverge from something. So he, he figured that, okay, well, there's no evidence of that. So let's just put that aside. And he did. And he, he just went on with just electric and magnetic fields. And so he put out his uh, paper on that, different versions of it, like two volumes of the, of the theory behind that. And then a couple decades later, uh, Oliver Heaviside, he was another genius, but he came more from the electrical engineering angle. Um, he picked up Maxwell's work and he kind of compactified all those equations. There were 20 equations and 20 variables that he compactified down into what's called vector form, vector notation. And in that video, for example, when I listed out those equations with the little cross of the curl and the divergence and all that, that's those things were his inventions. He came up with those particular mathematical, math, math, mathematical techniques to describe how that worked. The problem, though, is that he had an irrational hatred for uh, what are called potential fields. In other words, the force, this is why I'm getting into this, which is that when, when I talked about uh, the force fields that we're familiar with, like gravity, electricity, and magnetism, those are force fields, but force fields in themselves don't exist alone. They're actually uh, expressions of something deeper, something simpler. Just like the ocean waves are expressions of the wind and the underlying water dynamics, okay? There's stuff that's deeper, simpler, more fundamental than these force fields. And those deeper things are called potential fields. One of those is called the electric scalar potential, which sounds complicated, but it's just voltage, right? So when you think about like a five volt USB connection or a 1.5 volt battery, well, that's because the, the two ends of the battery have a difference of potential of 1.5 volts, which is which is kind of like electrical pressure, like how much work that, that particular battery can do. That, that's sort of what's determined by this uh, voltage value. So, so, but voltage in itself is, uh, it's, a, it's a potential. So electric scalar potential, when physicists say electric scalar potential, they're just, they just mean voltage. So there's voltage, which is like V, you know, the symbol V. And then you have another thing called the vector magnetic potential. And that is also something that's deeper than, you know, electricity, gravity, magnetism. And this vector potential, it's uh, Maxwell described it as, a kind of electromagnetic momentum. 
So imagine if you have a rope in water and you pull the rope through the water, okay? It's gonna drag some of that water with it along the sides of this rope. And so this water is gonna acquire some of the momentum that the rope you know, has imparted to it. And that's how he sort of visualized current going through a wire. So when you send electricity down a wire, it drags some of the ether with it. So there's this ether flow that goes along the wire and that's what he considered the electromagnetic momentum or the magnetic vector potential. And when this flow of ether curls, when it has a vorticity in it, uh, the axis of that vortex, that's a magnetic field line. So that's where magnetism comes from. Magnetism comes from the curl or the vorticity in the so-called magnetic vector potential, which is you know one step lo below magnetism in terms of simplicity. And you know you, the same thing with gravity. You've got gravitational force fields, and below that you got the gravitational potential, which is like a kind of space-time stress, like a like a pressure. And when you have uh, a gradient in that, so like when this point here has this so much pressure, and this one has a little bit more, this one has a little bit more gravitational potential, that line, this is this, this slope between them is what generates gravitational force. So if you put matter like right here, it's going to fall. It's or it's going to fall this way. Hmm. It's going it's to fall that way because it's going to go along the slope. So, you know, this is just like a, a little glimpse at the mathematical underpinnings of things. And I think it's important to understand that these force fields that we know, they are just more complicated expressions of simpler things. But see, here is where scalar physics comes into the picture. Scalar physics acknowledges that these potentials that generate the force fields that we know, that these potentials can be distorted in other ways that don't produce the forces that we know. So it is, it is possible, for example, to have an electric voltage that does not have a, a gradient in it um, and therefore does not produce an electric field. For example, if you have like a hollow metal ball, okay? So imagine like a metal ball, it's hollow, and you put a bunch of electricity, like a bunch of electric charge on it. That ball is gonna charge up to a certain voltage, okay? But, but the interior of this hollow metal ball, the, the voltage is going to be completely 100% uniform throughout the entire space inside this ball, okay? And if it's uniform, there is no gradient, and the equation says that a gradient in the voltage produces the electric force field. Well, if there's no gradient, there is no electric force field. All you have is a uniform potential. Uh, and so that shows that a potential can exist without producing these force fields. And then the question is, well, what else then can you do with these potentials that don't produce the force fields that we know? What else can you do with it? And well, that's that's the interesting question because you can take voltage, this is uniform voltage field, and you can vary it over time. You can like, you know, make it oscillate from high voltage to low voltage to high voltage to low voltage in a uniform, in a spatially uniform way. And if you tell that to a physicist, you know what they'll say? A mainstream physicist, they'll say, well, okay, well, what does that do? That doesn't do anything because if there's no gradient in the voltage, then there's no electric field. And if there's no electric field, then you know it can't move current through a wire. It can't send electromagnetic waves out or whatever. And so they just ignore it because they're like, it's useless. There's just nothing you can do with it. But what if that's not the case? What if it actually uh, affects the stress of space-time itself and produces gravitational effects, time dilation effects, uh, you know, and these other applications? Uh, and that's what they're not that's what they're not paying attention to. That's what they're, those are the doors that they keep closed. But scalar mm -hmm. physics says, no, it might actually mean something. So let's look in experimental records for any sign of a uniform voltage that changes over time or a diverging magnetic vector potential, for example. Where do we see that? Where does it show up? And is there anything in the experimental record that indicates there's something to it? And the answer is yes. Mm -hmm. A lot of these suppressed inventions, whether it's free energy, anti-gravity, longitudinal radio wave systems, things like that, they, they seem to employ physics principles that are along these lines. It might actually be the divergence of the magnetic vector potential that they're using to do these amazing things, to alter time, to create propulsion, for example. Uh, and so that's what scalar physics is. It's about taking an alternate route to what mainstream physics has taken by going back and looking at the simpler foundations of electrodynamics as we know it and opening those other doors that mainstream physics has closed. You hit so many of my questions right there. That was amazing. Um, Cause I was going to ask about Maxwell. You brought up his 20 equations. Um, you, I think you kind of touched a little bit, maybe I'm wrong about on heavy side in terms of him potentially coming in and uh, take, you know, simplifying those equations. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and would you agree that we lost some of the, what our capabilities are when it comes to electrical engineering, when, when that happened? Absolutely, because so so what Heaviside did was he 
he got rid of the potentials. So the magnetic vector potential and the electric scalar potential, he basically got rid of them. And he formulated Maxwell's four famous equations only in terms of the electric field and the magnetic field, the, the force fields. That's all he did. Mm. And, you know, I don't have a whiteboard with me, but I don't know if this will work. Let's see if I can uh, even show <laughs> the equations. There we go. All right. So, so there we go. These are the four Maxwell equations in black. Okay. Yeah, is it not working too well? I can bring them up as well. Okay. But see, see the stuff here in red? The red yeah. here and then and the red down here? Okay. Uh, yeah. This is backwards. That red stuff, that's what Maxwell left out. Or not out, uh, heavy side. That's what he left oh, out. Okay. And so everything in black, that's what you'll find in a textbook is... Uh, that's so what you'll find in a textbook is the standard Maxwell equations and everything in red is what he left out. And, hmm. and, the, and the way that they leave it out is by doing what's called a gauge fixing. It's called gauge fixing. And what gauge fixing is, is when, when they go through the process of deriving these Maxwell equations that relate electricity to magnetism, uh, when they do that, eventually they hit upon the, uh, the magnet or the, uh, the divergence of the magnetic vector potential and they hit upon a uniform voltage field that changes over time it shows up in the math and so they get to that point and they're like well that's that's inconvenient because we don't want these potentials messing up our maxwell equations so what can we do hmm what can we do oh I, here, here's what we'll do since the divergence of the vector potential which is like the, the triangle with the dot and the a you know the divergence of a uh since the, since we don't know what that is and we've never measured it uh it can it can be whatever we want it to be so let's make it zero and so they just literally take an eraser and, and erase it out of the equation by setting it to zero. And then they proceed as normal. And they're like, hey, look, we, we've got the four Maxwell equations. There's no potentials involved and everything's good. But because of that mistake, because of them doing that, uh, this gauge fixing, you know, one of the gauges is called the Coulomb gauge. And that's where you set it to zero. And another one's called the, uh, the Lorentz gauge where they set it. Well, they, they relate them to each other, but in, in an opposite way. So when you plug that into the equation, they cancel out. So it cancels out all the scalar stuff. So if you do one of those, you just wind up with Maxwell equations that don't use any of this fringe technology effects, whether it's gravity stuff, time dilation, you know, space contraction, space-time engineering. They left that out of there. And, and I had it right here on the paper in red. I mean, that's that's what would have opened the door for them, but they kept it out. And you know, I would I would like to think that they kept it out for innocent reasons. Maybe at the time, you know, they were all materialists or positivists. And mm. if you can't sense it with your five senses, then it doesn't exist. That was like a virtue back then, you know, to get because, you know, because they were rebelling against uh, the church and religion. Yeah. Right. So they were rebelling against it. And so but, but then they went to the other extreme of almost like worshiping matter instead of Mary. Right. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's kind of crazy. They went from one extreme to the other. Uh, and. Yeah, it, it, re it resulted in, in a very bad blunder. And all, all of modern physics, all of modern electrical engineering has been built upon that faulty foundation. So it's no wonder that over the past 100 years, physicists still cannot produce gravity in a lab artificially. <laughs> I mean, I'm talking yeah. about mainstream, mainstream science. I'm pretty sure they can. But yeah, mainstream science, I don't think is doing it. I think maybe just in the special access programs, I've had to guess. <laughs> special access programs and certain fringe inventors or physicists like for example eugene Podkletnov. yeah yeah right? he he he's done a lot of good work with gravity like generating gravitational impulses using not only superconductors but also um well superconducting discs that you fire an extreme electrical current into and this is current discharge through a superconductor generates uh coherent macroscopic quantum wave functions which have gravitational properties and um, speaking my language now Okay. <laughs> Do you think that's possible because the superconductors are, you know, warping the magnetic fields and then they're, as you were explaining, like zeroing out the magnetic field in that localized area? Or how do you think that's possible? I think that plays create? into it. I think that plays into it. But the, the thing about superconductors is that when you have charges that are in them or a collection of charges, all those charges, I mean, I'm talking about electrical charges like electrons, all right? Hmm. Those charges that are involved in that, they are quantum coherent. They're in a, in a coherent state. And this is a very important point. This is what I have in my notes to make sure to mention because it's, it's a very important point. You see, electrical engineering, electrical engineering, it doesn't care about any of this quantum stuff necessarily. It doesn't really care about the what's really going on at a, at a fun, fundamental level, okay? And so... When you send, let's say, one amp of current through a wire, okay, one amp of current through a wire, they don't they don't care whether it's 
like a trillion electrons moving very slowly at like one to 10 centimeters per hour through this wire. They don't care if it's that or if it's just a few electrons that are shooting extremely quickly down there. I mean, as long as the 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 proportion of charge to how long it takes to pass a certain point equals one amp, it's all the same to them, okay? But at the quantum level, there is a huge difference between sending a bunch of electrons down a wire versus a bunch of electrons or, or electrons that are in free space or in a through a superconductor that are going down it. And the difference is that, here we go, here's, here's a prop. So when you have a wire and electrons are going through it, they're actually it's they're actually bouncing around like crazy through the metal lattice. You know, the, all the copper ions and so on, the copper atoms. They're bouncing around, and it's only the general drifting that creates the current that we know as one amp. Okay, that's why they but, heat up too, right? Because they bounce into the atoms, mm -hmm. create yeah, friction. So, yeah, so that's how the old light bulbs work. You just send a bunch of electrons through this resistive wire, and then they hit so hard into the metal that it imparts energy to, into it, and then it starts to glow and generate light. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, but the problem is you, you, there's no there's no um, organized movement to it. It's just like it's just a bunch of noise that's drifting down the, down this wire. And so at a quantum level, each electron and its quantum wave function is not aligning with the quantum wave function of the electron next to it or down the wire. And so all these things, all these quantum effects are canceling each other out. So they, they cancel each other out and sum to zero. And uh, there's no then that's the reason why why uh, current through a wire doesn't have any macroscopic quantum weird woo-woo properties because all the quantum stuff has been canceled out by the electrons moving semi-randomly down the wire, which is very, very different from when you have a superconductor, uh, especially like a rotating superconducting disk like about uh, Kletnov's early experiments, which NASA tried to replicate. Uh, if, if you have something like that, then the electrons are moving, well, they're, they're delocalized inside of a, inside of a, uh, a superconductor, but there are other ways of getting them to move collectively where their wave functions sum together because they're, they all perfectly align like this, right? And the more they align, you stack, you know, more and more and more waves across each other, the, the higher the amplitude of the wave becomes until the wave is so big and has such a high amplitude that it starts having effects on the macroscopic scale, like producing gravity. Okay. Mm -hmm. You know, gravitational impulses. So, uh, Podkletnov and another guy named Claude uh, Poher, P O H E R. I don't know if that's how you pronounce his name, but Claude Poher, he's got videos on YouTube where, yeah, he also fires extremely high currents, electrical currents, into superconductors. And from that, generates what appears to be a gravitational impulse beam or a wave that knocks a pendulum upwards. So, he's got this arm, this metal arm, swinging uh, atop this like, uh, superconducting disc and when they fire into the disc this arm you know swings up and then the weight kind of pulls it back down so there's something there's something non-physical causing this to move and uh, as best as they can determine it's some kind of gravitational wave but it only comes about when you uh have collective electron movements okay as opposed to electrons going down a wire yeah, so is that like Cooper pairs, or would you think what is it the B uh, BCS? Is that the other uh, terminology? I can't remember what that stands for. Three people's names usually. But yeah, that's the collective coherence essentially that gets formed in superconductors. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you get uh, different kinds of coherence. Uh, Cooper pairs, I think, would be the the simplest one. And actually, there's a debate about whether Cooper pairs even exist or if it's something else going on. But yeah, but 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 you know those things. You know, superconductors are a way of uh, bringing purely quantum phenomena into our everyday large world. Uh, mm -hmm. And so like, for example, when you get an MRI done, you know, like a, like a CAT scan, if you get like an MRI done, uh, that uses very powerful and sensitive magnets called, uh, well, they're called squids, super, super conducting quantum interference devices. That's what they're called. Mm -hmm. But th they use quantum principles and superconductors in order to be able to measure uh, very weak magnetic fields. But not only that, but they can measure the magnetic vector potential directly. So besides MRIs, I think squids have other applications uh, in, in scalar physics. The only problem is I can't buy one because they're like twenty to thirty thousand dollars used for one squid. You know, so all this magical stuff, a lot of it just requires a lot of either either extremely high currents, extremely high electrical pulses, or high voltages, or you know these these expensive squids or something like that. And that's the reason why scalar physics isn't better known. Because you have to kind of explore the extremes of things in order to to access these weird effects. I'm glad you brought that up because I think a lot of people wonder, why can't I just do this at my house? Why can't we make it in my house? And I think that 
the what's getting made in the special access programs is these people have budgets of millions and billions of dollars. They have super expensive equipment. Uh, and I think if you were trying to draw as much power as you need in order to create like really visible amounts of the effects, you know, you're going to get noticed or you can have a very high electricity bill, I would imagine that's out there. Um, so when you were describing your uh, the the hollow ball, was that the uh, like oscillating spherical capacitor that you were mentioning in your video as well? Because that was something I just was having a difficult mm -hmm. time wrapping my brain around as well, where you have this uniform fee, uh, charge, I believe it was, if I'm in, correct me if I'm incorrect, but then the ball as well. Is that uh, the, yeah, yeah. Okay. Essentially, the difference is that if you just have just a metal ball, you know, just by itself, that's only one layer. That's only one electrode. So imagine if you take this hollow ball, okay and you cover it with uh, some sort of electrical insulator called a, a dielectric, meaning something that blocks electricity. So you put a dielectric around it. It could be wax, could be some sort of plastic, or uh, if you're really rich and in the black ops programs, you would cover it in barium titanate, which is a, a kind of material which has an extremely high dielectric constant. But anyway, so you do that, and then you cover it in another metal ball. So essentially, uh, along you know the surface, you have two layers. You got the metal layer, the insulator, and then the metal layer. Actually, that's that's three mm -hmm. layers, but you, you know, and that's what forms a capacitor. And what a capacitor is is it's a means for storing electrical energy. So, for example, if you put positive voltage here, negative voltage here, you get an electric field between them, and this electric field can store energy. Mm -hmm. uh, and when you put a dielectric in between it, it allows you to store even more energy than you normally would in that space. So, the higher the dielectric constant is, the more energy you can store. In there so that's what that's what a spherical capacitor is is where you do that around the entire uh spherical shape so and i don't want to move totally away from this but i don't want to forget this is that are you familiar with the metamaterial of magnesium bismuth zinc in mm -hmm. terms of ufology is that the same concept you think there because isn't bismuth a, uh one of those materials that's like essentially a the uh, what is it dielectric is that what you said well a, a bismuth is actually more of a, a semiconductor Okay. It's, oh, okay. more of a, it's more like a well, metalloid semiconductor kind of thing, but that is also useful because earlier when I mentioned um, trying to create collective electron motions or collective mm -hmm. electron currents that are coherent, uh, that the problem with using things like copper, for example, the, the problem with using copper is that, as I mentioned, the electrons knock around like crazy in there. Uh, and there's, there's other issues too. It's called like the skin effect where the higher the frequency that you're trying to pump through there, the more the electrons want to push to the outside and go along the skin of the material. So you're missing all this awesome copper in the middle to try to conduct it. Hmm. Uh, but, but long story short, semiconductors are halfway between co conductors like metals and non-conductors like the dielectrics that I mentioned. Okay. So the halfway in between, and that has certain benefits for, for, uh, smoothing out and spreading out the electricity that you're trying to send through something. So if, so if you want to have like a sheet of current that's moving collectively down, you'd want something like a plasma or something like a like a semiconductor in order to, to do that, more so than copper or more so than uh, pure dielectric, which you can't send electricity through it. You can only try to try to compress it like a spring electrically. So so bismuth and the magnesium thing, um, that one, and, and we're, we're talking about samples that have been retrieved from supposed alien you know alien vehicle crashes yeah. essentially and and we don't know if it's really aliens or if that was like early 1950s or 60s black ops technology that they're experimenting with uh although interestingly enough um one of my professors in college who who taught my quantum physics classes i, I met him before going to college on, on a like a like a summer program at my high school and he took me to his lab where he's working on and he showed me what was it called it was called like epit epitaxial something Vapor deposition, that's what it was, epitaxial vapor de deposition. And that's where they fire these uh, gasified metals and substances at a surface to coat it in alternating layers of very, very thin elements. And he showed me a cross-section of this material. And years later, when I saw the news or, or the video of that UFO footage, it was identical. <laughs> but that was but that was supposedly retrieved decades earlier. You see, so it's it's interesting how science eventually comes around to what the UFO, the UFO community is, finds out, you know, years, if not decades earlier. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. It definitely feels like we are, you know, I, I don't know, it, to me, it just feels like reverse engineering, like our science is catching up to the weird stuff that we're seeing float around. Totally. But real quick, I want to ask a few more questions on the scalar physics stuff. And mm -hmm. first question is, do you believe there is an ether in terms of, uh, you know, do you think that's the answer for how a lot of this stuff is, can be possible? Because I think a lot of physicists would say, given our conventional understanding related to Einstein's theories that we can't do a lot of the stuff that we're talking about right now. Mm -hmm. uh, what are your thoughts? 
Well, you know, the reason why modern physics kind of discounts the idea of the ether, it traces back to that Michelson-Morley experiment. Uh, and that's where, uh, was it the early 1900s or the late 1800s? I always forget. But anyway, that, that's where they literally tried to detect the motion of the Earth through a stationary ether. So they figured, well, you know, the Earth is orbiting the sun. And if it's orbiting the sun, it's moving. So therefore, it's moving through a, a medium that fills the universe, a medium that fills the universe. And if that's the case, then light in the direction of movement should behave differently than light that's moving perpendicularly to it. It's, it's kind of like uh, it's kind of like the Doppler effect when you have a sound source that is moving away from you and then the frequency gets lower. You know, like motion affects frequency and wavelength of, of waves. So they did an experiment where they, where they compared how light moves, um, you know, in the direction of motion versus perpendicular to it. Uh, and they expected one of these to be shorter. They expected this one to be shorter, to have a different wavelength or a different frequency. And what they found is that they're actually both identical, hmm. which means either that the ether was moving with the Earth or the ether did not exist. That's that's what they were thinking at the time. And uh, and that's when Einstein came along. And so rel relativity, uh, Einstein's relativity won out because it didn't depend on an ether to explain a lot of these phenomena, right? The problem, though, was that that this, interfer this interferometer experiment, uh, they're sending light, this path, into the ether, um, but they weren't taking into account the fact that when you do that, the, this path length itself, it also shrinks. So there's length contraction in the way. So the light that goes here, it returns sooner than it would this way. And that's kind of, that, that ended up canceling out uh, any sort of change in the velocity of the speed of light. You see, so when they measured it and it ended up being exactly the same thing, it's because essentially they were measuring light with light itself. So when light speed slows down uh, and your clock also slows down and your ruler shrinks, well, it's still going to be the same proportion, you know? So you're still going to think that, oh, well, the speed of light is always the speed of light. And that's the, the central premise of relativity, that the speed of light is always constant, no matter who the observer is, no matter if it's moving, not moving in a gravitational field or in, in, in you know, free, empty, flat space. Um, but that wasn't... See, relativity was only one of the many ways that, that you could explain some of these experimental observations. Uh, there was a, another parallel theory called the Lorentz ether theory by Hendrik Lorentz. Okay. And his theory did involve an ether. And, and all the math was essentially the same as relativity. It made the same predictions. It worked just as well. But it required the existence of, a, of an absolute stationary ether that permeated all the space. And so physicists, you know, they kind of compared the two. And they said, well, um, both of these theories, they got essentially the same math. And they both exp explain the same experiments that we've observed. But this one has something extra that relativity doesn't even need. So let's go with relativity because it's a simpler theory that accounts for all these known observations. Mm -hmm. That's the reason why they went with it. The problem is, th the reason why they couldn't distinguish the two is because they didn't have the technology at the time in order to do the experiments to distinguish whether there actually was an ether or not. Mm -hmm. So because they didn't have the tools, they assumed that that thing didn't exist and it wasn't relevant. Just like earlier, you know, when they discounted the vector magnetic potential and the electric scalar potential and the whole scalar stuff, they discounted it because they didn't, ha they haven't, hadn't yet detected it in experiments. So, do you think that then there is, I presumably that there is an ether? Do you think Tesla was right? What are your thoughts? And totally. And you know what the ironic thing is? Nowadays, physicists talk about the vacuum being not empty space, but teeming with a zero point energy field with virtual photons, virtual particle flux. And, and, and now they talk about vacuum polarization as if the vacuum itself is a dielectric medium. So they're talking about the ether. It's just these Different switched words, terms. Right? Yeah, so it's, <laughs> it's like not, not, not to look like fools for like, see, here's the problem. If a physicist nowadays says that he or she believes in the ether, they're going to get laughed at. Yeah, you can't you can't use that word. But if they say that, yeah, you know, I totally believe in, in the, the vacuum virtual particle flux. They're like, oh, wow, smart, smart person, you know, thumbs up. <laughs> And, uh, it's funny how much of it's just semantics, right? I'm bringing ether yeah. back, by the way, though. I'm bringing it back. I don't give mm -hmm. a crap. People think I'm crazy because I think I agree with you on that. But yeah, yeah, a lot of it's just, oh, what's your terminology and what have you. So anyway, continue if you want. Yeah, it's, 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 uh, it's terminology and it's also the, also the principle of it. Because, okay, you know, granted, the ether that people believed in during the 16, 17, and 1800s, it might, the real ether might not exactly behave exactly the way that they, that they figured. Um, but it's pretty close. And I think I think if you take that with the whole virtual particle stuff, uh, you can take both of those forward and, and and converge upon a concept of the ether that is accurate, that is practical, that cannot be uh, 
cannot be disproven because it's it's solid you know it's like it's a, it's a real principle uh, and so we do have to go down the ether track we just have to make it more correct and more accurate to reality than than what they had in the 1800s essentially so do you think that we've already figured out a unification theory then of quantum field mechanics or quantum field theory and general relativity do you think it's been suppressed or what are your thoughts on that uh, i do believe that well all right so the way that i would put it is that even starting back in the 1800s when when maxwell came out with this theory and then oliver heaviside came along and kind of uh, handicapped it I do believe that there were certain people, um, probably in government or maybe in private clubs or something like that, who who started taking those other doors. And they started experimenting with some of these principles. Because, you know, during, during the time of the, the late 1800s, that's when he had Tesla already starting to do his technologies. So technology was already starting to evolve at that point that could go in very interesting directions. So people had the tools back then to go down that route. Uh, it's just that mainstream public science was kind of like a like a like a ship that's been cut off you know, from shore and is now just drifting into into oblivion essentially and it's been drifting into oblivion for the decades since then and, and nowadays we hold quantum theory and and relativity high up on this pedestal as if that's the end all be all and then of course you got string theory and people who believe in dark energy and dark matter and quantum loop gravity and all these things but what, what if all of that is is barking up the wrong tree what if the wrong turn was actually taken a century ago and if you go back and you go with this parallel path, that is the way to control gravity. That is the way to control time and space and so on. Uh, and, and I think that some people, even in the late or even in the 1890s, were doing that. So because back then in ufology, you had things called the, the uh, airship or the mystery airship sightings of the early 1890s, where what looked like these uh, cylindrical cigar shaped crafts uh, would, you know, a lot of people would see them and some of them would land and the person would come out and talk with someone and ask asked one person to mail a letter for him. It sounded like a human to me. It sounded like, like people were occupying these things and experimenting with them. Uh, and so perhaps that was some of the earliest uh, black ops stuff that was going on. And it's only continued since that time. Now, in terms of quantum physics and relativity, I mean, it has a lot of, a lot of uh, validity to it, of course. But if you really get down to the fundamentals of each theory, you start to realize that physicists who subscribe to it, even they themselves don't fully know what they're talking about, or they don't fully know what it says about reality, what things actually are at, at a substantive, you know, fundamental level. They can only describe how things behave, for example. Uh, to, to give one uh, instance of that, uh, the Einstein's field equations, which is something that Jacques Sarfati is always talking about. He always talks about the Einstein field equations, all right? Well, on the left side of the equation, you have all these terms describing the curvature of space-time, okay, so how much space and time warp. That equals a constant, you know, a bunch of constants, times uh, the uh, the stress energy tensor, which is how much matter and energy and momentum is compacted into a, a given volume of space. So basically, the, the equation talks about how much a particular group of matter and energy and, and momentum creates curvature in space and time. That's all the equation is. And then, and then Sarfati, he adds a, a constant on the right side of that equation, which he calls S. I don't know if S stands for Sarfati or Schmuck, but it's one of those two. <laughs> you know? Uh, pretty but, sure they're, 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 Schmuck, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. S <laughs> force. So. Yeah, the, the, yeah, I yeah. talked to him the other week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so you, got the, you got the Schmuck factor on the right side of that <laughs> equation, okay? And, and this thing, uh, it amplifies or it decreases how much a particular uh, clustering of matter and energy affects space and time. So his, his point, you know, and I can follow along with a lot of what he says, not everything, but a lot of it. Uh, his point is that if you can control this, this S variable, the schmuck variable, then you can control how much matter warps space and time. And if you increase that to an extremely high level using this, uh, this, this frilled metamaterial that he's always talking about. So if you do that as an example, then a given quantity of energy, whether it's electric energy, magnetic, mass, whatever, can have an extreme warping effect on space-time. And that's how you can, uh, I don't know, open a portal perhaps with a, with a 9-volt battery. You don't have to have the, the capabilities of a nuclear power plant next door just to burst open space and time. And that's the issue with a lot of um, mainstream approaches to, let's say, time travel or opening singularities or you know warping space and time things like that is they're always going off the assumption that the einstein's field equation is what it is and there is no schmuck factor you know it's just it just is what it is and 
So therefore, it takes a gargantuan amount of energy and mass or matter you know, moving in crazy ways in order to warp space and time. And that's why they've never been able to do it, because it's, it's practically impossible. And yet, go ahead. And I, I guess I was going to say, because you know, that, that rings true with what Jack told me as well. And his whole theory it doesn't take a lot of energy to produce these types of gravitational effects. And that also reminded me of what Thomas Bearden said on the psychotronics uh, video I was watching the other night, where he talked about the Philadelphia experiment. And he said that you could make a battleship levitate with a flashlight. And that's, I think, essentially what it was saying is you don't need a lot of energy because you just have this tiny battery in there in general. But do you think that you think that Sarfati's, uh, you know, theories like that can actually really realistically produce the types of gravitational effects that we need to have, you know, macroscopic, visible, large gravitational effects to actually make a portal? Or what is your thoughts? Yeah, well, his S factor, uh, he himself, when he talks about it, he... he from what I understand, he frames it from the viewpoint of some sort of a, a relative permittivity. In other words, essentially that the dielectric constant of the vacuum can be modified. Uh, I might be getting that wrong, but I think that's what it is. Because because you know he says he says that on one hand, but then on other times it seems like he says no, that's not it. So I'm not quite sure what he means there. But that's the impression that I got. It has to do with a dielectric constant or the index of refraction of the ether, essentially. That when you modify that then that modifies everything. That modifies intermolecular forces, uh, the electric field, magnetic field, gravitational stuff. It modifies all of it because you're you're modifying the uh, the matrix code, essentially. You're kind of modifying space-time at the root. And, uh, and the issue with it is that normally uh, when you have no gravity around and no funny manipulation of scalar physics, that S equals 1. So it's not apparent in Einstein's equations that there is an S there because if it's just one, you know, something times one equals itself. So that that's that thing by itself is all that's needed in that equation for it to work out. But there might actually be an actual S constant there or S variable there, which can be technologically manipulated. And I'm pretty sure that that, that if that exists, then that is what's being manipulated through, let's say, diver the divergence of the vector potential and that a scalar physics stuff. You remember the, the stuff in my sheet of paper that was written in red? Yeah. I believe that that... Stuff. That, that extra stuff, I believe, is what modifies that S constant. Hmm. Okay. So there's potentially like a unification between Jack's theories and, and other people. Are you familiar with Salvatore Paez's as, as work as well? Yes. Yeah, I, re I read his patent recently and I watched some of his interviews. So I think he's pretty, I think, I think he's pretty spot on. However, he does lean more mainstream than Serfati does. Because when he talks about warping space-time, um, he's the one that believes that a huge amount of energy is required. Uh, in, a, in a compact area, and that's why he talks about setups like a like a like a charged electrical disc rotating rotating at extremely high speeds, like thirty thousand revolutions per minute. Which, mm -hmm. I mean, if if you try to do that for real, it would it would blow apart with any man made material that we're we're familiar with. Mm -hmm. uh, he he's supposedly in the projects that he worked for. He did do setups of that, but it was like less power and like slower rotation. So it would I mean that was still feasible, but I think to scale it up to where he wants it to be might be hard and instead of having physical rotating things which oh which by the way speaking of joseph farrell uh the nazi de glucka you know the, the mm -hmm. de glucka device uh some some people believe that it used uh, rotating mercury right yeah i'm and, planning on looking at a rotating mercury because it seems kind of interesting yeah and rotating mercury like ancient vimana technology like you know supposedly that's where that comes from yeah, the ancient ancient pre pre uh mahabharata um epics in india the civilization that came a little bit before that they they were the ones that had this advanced technology according to their mythology in india uh and and they had flying machines and they had what appeared to be nuclear weapons for example there's like accounts of it in their myths of those things i mean for all we know it didn't even happen on earth it could have happened on some other planet and the myths were brought here to earth you know for all we know right that, that's maybe that's why there's no archaeological evidence of some of those things but that's a, that's a whole side topic but point being but point being that salvatore Piaz, when he wants to have a, a rotating charge disc Maybe you don't need that. Maybe you just need rotating mercury because it's metal that's rotating. And you just mm -hmm. charge it to high enough voltage. And uh, perhaps you get some interesting effects. Well, I mean, you wouldn't even have to like pump voltage into it necessarily because when you take mercury and you roll it over the surface of glass, you get something called the triboelectric effect. And that's where it generates its own static electricity. So if you've got this swirling uh, uh, vortex of mercury, 
uh, essentially you would get it's it producing its own high voltage field for all i know i mean that's just like a side note i'm like i'm going off on tangents oh, good. <laughs> i think that this is this is my message to jack out there because i guess we've had a little bit of falling out for some reason <laughs> um but uh no no fault of my own but i think that a lot of people like for me it's like the truth is somewhere in the middle like i've interviewed salvatore Paez, i've interviewed jack sarfati and you know it's like physicists versus engineers mm -hmm. and they have different ways of seeing stuff and i kind of think that there's definitely in my opinion at least uh, a way to manipulate gravity out there and maybe the answer is somewhere in the middle maybe it doesn't take huge amounts of energy to pull off but maybe it's not simple as just using einstein's equations um is that kind of how you see it as well i mean you seem like a guy who kind of met, takes a measured response on everything yeah, if you go back in time and you look at when quantum physics and relativity came around, it's not like the the pre-physics of that time period, like the Newtonian classical physics, it's not like that was proven false. It was just proven incomplete. And, you know, Newtonian physics is a limiting case or a subset of quantum physics and relativity. So in other words, if you, if you take this complicated machinery of quantum physics and relativity and you say, okay, well, let's, let's assume that it's actually simpler than this and it's a little bit simpler there, and uh, you scale it up a little bit, and all those little weird quantum things, they start canceling each other out, and what you're left with is classical physics as we know it. Like, you know, the like billiard balls hitting other billiard balls and transferring energy and momentum. The things that we learn in high school and junior high about science, that is what falls out of quantum physics and relativity when you make certain simpl simplifying assumptions. So, what that means is that quantum physics and relativity are very likely subsets or limiting cases of something that goes even beyond it. And, you know, a simple example of that is what I have, you know, on, on my sheet here, which is that you've got the Maxwell equations, which are, you know, tiny, and then you just add a little bit more to it. But that little thing that you add to it, that's like a superset of the subset. Mm -hmm. So, so I do think that, um, you know, scalar physics can take us a, a step beyond, and we do have to look at the areas that have been ignored up to now. Okay. A couple more questions of this. I'm loving the science conversation, by the way, and I think the chat is as well. So we're gonna keep mm -hmm. going this direction for now. Um, one thing that I want to go back to briefly is, do you believe that dark matter and dark energy are real? Do you think that we've simply misunderstood some other property or interaction of the ether and the vacuum of space-time? Well, you know, dark matter and dark energy, the only reason why those have been invented as explanations is because the equations that they're going off of are those incomplete equations. There are They're, they're working with an inc incomplete version of gravity in space time and relativity and general relativity and so once they encounter these actual anomalies and measurements they have, they have two options they can either change their theory or they can make new predictions that are false based on the old theory that is incomplete and i think that's the route that they've gone because it's a safer route it's, it's safer to respect you know the elders and and go with the existing science and don't question it and merely merely point it in a new direction than to say oh no you guys were flawed and you, you're you miss things for the past century, <laughs> you know, all those hundreds, if not thousands of PhDs were looking and lo looking in the wrong direction, you know, <laughs> well, that's what bugs me. Cause you've got people out there and I'm just going to throw shade on Neil deGrasse Tyson. Cause it's, uh, in vogue right now, but you know, you got him going, well, we can't understand this. We can't understand a double slit experiment. We don't know what dark energy and dark matter are. And it just, it, we yeah. don't know, uh, you know, and they go on and talk shows and talk about it. It's like, well, there has to be an answer. You know, mm -hmm. maybe we should look back uh what we thought was true before you know maybe it's not as simple as you know expanding upon what we've already developed but actually like taking a hard look at what we already thought was true and then looking at it through a new lens out there what is your opinion on some of uh what i would call the science influencers that are out there do you think that they're getting in their own way do you think they're stopping progress well it's it's become in vogue well so so back in college when i was doing my quantum physics classes my professor said to the class that it's not our job to understand why or what is actually happening it is our job to do the calculations and get the results to do the measurements you know i mean what what, what kind of mindset is that and, and and i think it was his way of maybe coping with the incomprehensibility of certain aspects of quantum physics because you know uh what was it richard feynman said that if you're not uh, uh mystified by quantum physics and you don't truly understand it something like that i'm paraphrasing but basically, it's it's become acceptable to treat quantum physics as people treated, uh, you know, Catholicism back in the Middle Ages, which is God works in mysterious ways. Don't point out the contradictions. If you do, you 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 don't you're not displaying faith. 
So if you want to have faith, just don't question. Just do. You know, just, just do what you're told. <laughs> pay, pay your indulgences and, and you'll get to heaven one day. That's a I good mean, analogy. Yeah. Yeah. Because uh, I, you know, I, I think there is this, this certain weird dogma now that's been built into academia. And uh, it feels like a lot of people are afraid to push the boundaries. And I think that, in my opinion, science isn't as much as science is iterative. Um, it really goes in leaps and bounds, in my opinion, not mm -hmm. necessarily in like tiny little footpaths. And I think people have kind of forgotten that, you know, there's been people that made huge strides. And I think that if we were to look back in history, we would see that a lot of these uh, great scientists that we revere were probably thought of as crazy or, you know, what have you back in the past. Do you agree? Yeah, they, they were. And and our, our perception of them nowadays is a very whittled down car caricature of who they actually were. Like Isaac Newton, for example. Isaac Newton, what, what do we remember him for? Okay, the apple falling on his head and he looked up at the moon and connected the two, like gravity to, or, to orbital, or, or, orbital motion. Okay. Um, but he was an alchemist as well. He was deeply into al alchemy and occultism because he, because at the time there was no political correctness. There was no, uh, you know, government grants and things like that, that kept everyone in line. So, Hey, if you're an alchemist and you're trying to figure out gravity, it's all part of the same picture of trying to figure out what's actually going on. Uh, and of course, but, but the nowadays we just trying to try to try to ignore that, that shadier side of him, you know, the, the alchemy <laughs> stuff. <laughs> But but it's but it's it's modern society yeah. that that's at fault. He was complete in himself. He was his own person. But we only want to take that little tiny extract of him that suits our blind spots and our biases. And that's that's wrong. You know that's wrong. It's like a, the same thing with science nowadays. Any any time a major anomaly occurs that doesn't fit theory, they're confronted with a choice: do we hush it up, or do we go against the entire establishment? And most mm -hmm. of the time, they they hush it up. You know, and same thing in archaeology or biology, genetics whatever things that are just too controversial it's like it's like planet of the apes you know the original planet of the apes movie with dr zayas trying to yeah. try, try, try to keep keep things hush and that's where we are so intellectually and scientifically we are still in a kind of dark age even nowadays and you know and that's why it's no surprise that after all these decades and you know particle colliders uh, man billions and billions of dollars spent like what do we have anti-gravity yet in the mainstream no <laughs> no we don't Meanwhile, meanwhile, we have these private contractors working with black ops and military flying around and, you know, super doing super duper ships and going at like Mach 60 or whatever and doing right angle turns in midair. Mm. They're doing that. Why? Because they don't have the reputations to defend in the private little labs that they're working in. It's still surprising yeah. it wants to come out either because, yeah. you know, you, you would just get attacked by mainstream academia where it's like they're getting paid hundreds of thousands of dollars a year and they get to work with magic. Why, why would they want to come out and risk any of that, right? Well, exactly. And that's an impediment to disclosure. The fact that yeah. you do have all these people and organizations and uh, the, the entire military industrial complex getting rich off of their asymmetric power advantage over the mainstream. Mm -hmm. And so in a way, you know, NASA and academia, it's kind of like a, like a circus sideshow to, to, to divert us from the real thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and, so, and so that's why me personally, that's, that's one of the reasons why I left. I, did, I didn't want to go into academia because I knew I'd be entering into this censored, politically restrictive uh, environment. I didn't want to do that. I, I would rather make money in some other way unrelated to all this and then do my physics on my own time on the side because that gives me total freedom to do and say whatever I want. You know, no NDAs, no worries about grants and reputations and, you know, hoping to one day get tenure or something like that. Uh, it's, it's more freedom, but at the same time, of course, it is harder because if you don't have as much funding, then... You can't do as much. So it's just kind of like a, a pro and con to each. Well, I appreciate your work. Um, let's talk a little bit more about scalar physics and uh, radar. Uh, what do you see? Do you see a connection at all between scalar physics and radar? Um, and... Yeah, well, so so radar, you're just using regular electromagnetic waves. You send them mm -hmm. out and then the reflections you monitor. And depending on their timing, you can, you can determine in the direction, you can determine how far away something is. I mean, that's the basics mm -hmm. of radar. Uh, but of course, radar can be taken in more complicated ways where not only do you send it out and get it back, but you, you monitor how, what you get back, how, how the wave front of it is shaped. Uh, and mm -hmm. that, that gets more into like holography and some really complicated applications of radar, uh, which still yeah, isn't thinking quite... like phase conjugation. Oh, great. So, so phase conjugation, that's something that Tom Bearden talks about all the time. Because because Tom Bearden, he he, uh, he was a retired lieutenant colonel in the army. All right, he spent twenty years in the army, and he has a he has a minor. Well, he's he's got degrees in mathematics and I believe engineering, something like that. 
So mm-hmm. he's, he's got a background in it. And then when he was in the military, he also got a grant to study some other, some other things. So he picked up a lot of different, you know, various types of scientific skills, uh, enough, enough to probably make sense of what he, what he heard through the grapevine while being in the military from like these, these closed off special access programs and so on. He probably picked up a lot of it and then he put the pieces together himself using his knowledge. And so that's why when he talks about a lot of these fringe scalar physics applications, a lot of it seems very spot on, but then other parts of it seems to me, it's almost like he just did the best he could to try to piece things together. And he himself didn't even know hundred percent about how it worked, but hmm. you know, so he talked about it in a more general way without really giving the math. I mean, me coming from a physics and electrical engineering background, the math for me is final in the sense that if you can dissect it and look at the math, then you can tell what's actually going on and whether it's actually true or false. Okay. But if you don't have the math and you only have concepts, then it's more in the realm of maybes like, okay, yeah, this could make sense, but we'll have to test it out. I'm not quite sure, you know? So Tom Bearden, he talks about a lot of it, uh, not in terms of math, but in terms of principles and ideas mm-hmm. and, and theories, which is good. I mean, it's really good for, for exploring new ideas and, and trying to figure out the esoteric applications of scalar physics. However, I would have liked to see a little bit more math in some of the stuff so that I can kind of look under the hood and see if it's, if it's uh, truly valid and if there are any other ways of interpreting it than what he interpreted as. Now, so, okay, so going back to radar, what, what Tom Bearden talks about is where uh, you take electromagnetic waves, okay, and you overlap them in such a way that they cancel out. Yep. So imagine you've got a wave like this, okay, but you've got another wave that goes down like this. So you got one amplitude, one electric field vector pointing this way, another electric field vector pointing this way. And if you overlap them in space and you get canceling, electromagnetic fields so it's, it's uh, basically it's called a um, vector summing so you see vector mm-hmm. you sum these vectors to zero now physics would say um if you sum it to zero then you just got empty space there's nothing there but that's not true because what you do have is you still have stress on that space time point okay it's just like if you have once again the rope analogy yeah 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 exactly so if you have like a rope okay and you pull it from one end at a certain amount of force like 10 newtons it's going to fly off in that direction it's going to accelerate in that direction if you apply 10 newtons in the other direction it's going to fly off in that direction now if you apply 10 newtons on both ends equally what happens it's going to be stationary just as if you had applied no force at all and so modern physicists would say okay well they're you know the force is summed to zero it doesn't matter if it's zero force or if it's minus 10 and plus 10 or minus 100 or plus 100 it's all going to sum to zero so therefore there is no motion and these are all equivalent, but they're not equivalent because one has no tension. The other one has more tension in the rope and the other one has a lot of tension in the rope. And eventually the rope is just going to snap. Hmm. So, good point. so when you sum these vectors together, electric this way, electric that way, or you know, magnetic this way, magnetic that way, when you sum them to zero, it's going to put stress on space time. And if you do it enough, space time, just like the rope is going to snap. And that's when you get a portal or a singularity. You know, you reach, you go beyond a certain threshold of what space time can sustain. And you're going to essentially create like a, like a mini black hole or something like that, you know, due to all the space time stress. And, I do know in this case. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. And, and if you, if you try to do that using just uh, w- without the schmuck factor, if you just try to do it just uh, the regular, the regular way, then you're, you're going to need way too much electromagnetic energy to, I mean, there's just no way it's not, not even a nuclear power plant could, could put out, that much power to rip it open but that if you've, you've got that s factor that you can manipulate then it's kind of like it's kind of like uh like like putting oil in a door lock so that you can pick it more easily okay you can, you yeah. can pick it way more easily make the so, process more efficient exactly yeah you you catalyze it's like a catalyst okay it makes it more efficient and at that point yeah sure you know you, you could you could like i said a nine volt battery to lift an airplane or something like that or or, or so on um mm, but okay yeah but but even even without that even if you just cancel electromagnetic waves and you sum them to zero uh that results in well you get rid of the electric you get rid of maybe the magnetic so all you're left with then is, is a potential remember remember how i talked about how force fields are arise out of simpler potential fields well if you get rid of the force fields you still got the potential fields so you've got this potential field beam that you're essentially aiming mm-hmm. And it can't be detected by ordinary instruments because ordinary instruments like radios or you know something like that, they only rely on the electric force or the magnetic force. That's what moves them. So without that, you can't detect it. But potentials still have an effect on matter. Okay, They still have an effect on matter, which was proven via the Aharonov-Bohm effect, where 
what they did was they, they had a setup where you had like a coil of wire. Okay. It's like a, like a toroid or like a really long coil of wire. And when you have a coil of wire, all the magnetic field is concentrated inside the space of the coil. There is no magnetic field around it. However, there is still a magnetic vector potential circulating around the coil in the space outside of it. And so they fired an electron through this magnetic vector potential in the absence of any magnetic field. And they found that uh, when they did some quantum experiments with it, that this vector magnetic potential would alter the quantum phase of the electron. It altered it on a quantum level. And, you know, some physicists will say, well, that doesn't mean anything. That doesn't have any effects, but it actually does. I mean, it can affect things in very surprising ways. All right. So, you know, to answer your questions, radar, if you take a radar beam and you sum it with itself in an, in an opposing way, like a phase conjugated way, then you kind of cancel all the vectors out and you get a scalar beam that you can do things with. Now, Bearden said that if you take two such scalar beams and you cross them, okay, in the yep. region where they cross, the scalar stuff starts canceling itself out and then you're back to an, a regular electromagnetic wave, right? And so, the, so uh, in this way, for example, you can take two scalar beams, send them way far out, cross them at a very remote distance, and you're essentially creating like an electromagnetic fireball in that spot. With nothing in between that's detectable because it's all scalar in between, but but mm -hmm. you know, but but it's becoming, it's becoming real again, at that point where it intersects, and that is the thing that I would like to see the math for. Uh, he he does cite a couple papers by Whitaker from 1912 or 1907, I forget now, but it's the early 1900s by Whitaker, where the math is in there. Uh, I only took a look at it once, and I need to take a look at it again to really try to nail down how that process would actually work. So, so right now, I put that stuff, you know, the, the crossing beams and so on, I put that in the very likely but not fully convinced yet category for me. So I'm mm -hmm. still exploring it is what I'm trying to say. Interesting. Um, yeah, that's, that's. I mean, you hit every single aspect I was going to ask you about there as well. Um, and I think that's probably good for the scalar stuff. I guess one other aspect I want to ask you about is what do you think about Antarctica? Um, mm. do you have anything because have you are you familiar with Eric Hecker at all and his claims about the um the ice cube uh antenna or um at all in terms of basically saying that it might be a directed energy weapon and not just a receiver and that they may be having, potentially having faster than light communication going on down there? Do you have any yeah, thoughts on any of that? Yeah, I heard about that. And actually, one of my physics professors in college was working on the neutrino detectors down there, supposedly. Yeah, yeah so, so yeah. I know someone who supposedly works there. Um, and so you think there's more going on down there than meets the eye or what's your thoughts? Well, yeah. So, so typically when you have big projects like that, where a lot of money is put into it and especially in Antarctica uh, or like CERN, for example, mm -hmm. big projects like that, usually they are dual purpose where you've got the public purpose and then you've got the secret, you know, black ops military purpose to it. Now, I don't, I don't know if ice cube specifically would be a particle beam weapon. However, I do know, or I strongly, strongly suspect that CERN is capable of it. And the way that they're doing it is they're doing it through what they call particle beam dumps, which is after they've run their experiments and they've got all the circulating energy, they need to dump it into something in order to get rid of it so they can mm -hmm. work on the machines and do maintenance and so on. So they got these giant graphite cylinders the size of school buses made of graphite. Okay, so they're made of graphite. And so they just take the beam and they divert it into this graphite block so that it can absorb the energy and they can get rid of it. However, when you do that, you generate a very big, strong beam of extremely high neutrinos or high energy neutrinos, uh, higher than even what the sun puts out. Okay. So that is a kind of quantum, technically, technically it's like a quantum particle beam weapon that they're doing through these graphite blocks, uh, which to the public, they're saying, oh no, it's just a way of getting rid of energy. And yet that stuff is there. And it's, they admitted it themselves that it generates a, a copious amount of neutrinos when they do that. I think that's a small example of dual use right? Where there's something underneath the nose of everyone that is being used for some other purpose, potentially. And I can't rule out, therefore, that ice cube and neutrino detectors and things like that don't also have uh, a connection, which is interesting because CERN, graphite blocks, high energy neutrinos, and then Antarctica, neutrino detectors. What is it about neutrinos? There's something special about neutrinos that is common to both. And, uh, you know, maybe, maybe that's something worth looking into. Interesting. Well, thank you for your thoughts on that. I think I want to ask about Kona Blue here because I, I promised we would get to it, even though we've been having such a great science discussion. I feel like we could talk for several hours more about the science yeah. side of it here. Um, have you had an opportunity to look at this Kona Blue document? This uh, mm -hmm. was declassified by a AARO, I believe. I looked at the dates. It looked like it had been kind of approved for declassification back in February. 
Um, today, uh, it, it, I don't know if you're familiar, but for the people who are listening to this, um, there was a Tucker Carlson, Joe Rogan podcast that dropped today. It leaked last night early. Uh, I snapped a clip of it from some other people that basically said that Tucker Carlson, it sounded like Tucker Carlson had been told by Lou Elizondo because he was the head of ATIP. Mm -hmm. And there's some reference to ATIP and his connection there that uh, Lou Elizondo had been known that this document was real, that this program, this special access program called Kona Blue is real, and that he was sworn to secrecy, had to sign a document for it. It seems like he told Tucker Carlson this. Tucker Carlson told Joe Rogan on the podcast. And when we look through this, it talks about some pretty incredible stuff. And I want to get your opinion on whether or not you think this is real disinformation partially disinformation what aspects of it are compelling to you um some of the things and i'll go ahead and just share it real quick as well so that we can just kind of take a look um this should show up let's double check can you see that as well yeah yeah okay so they have stuff like there's different they breaks it down into different centers so you have this national institute for discovery which is data collection experimental division medical division data analysis, you've got your advanced technology center uh, regarding access to recovered advanced technology. Pretty interesting. Uh, collecting oral histories from certain sources that were out there. Consciousness center um, and collecting critical data utilizing remote sensing. That's very interesting, in my opinion. Um, and then your integration center, which is taking data from other centers that are out there. Now, some of the aspects of this that I thought were interesting, I may have to go to um oh yeah here's the summaries of them in general um some of the stuff that i thought was interesting it talks about remote viewing in here expand on remote viewing and remote communication retrieve data and transport across dimensional and space-time barriers mm -hmm. maybe we just start with that well what is your thoughts on remote viewing and transporting either consciousness or matter across dimensions and space-time given the context of the science that we've been talking about here well, my impression from reading this document is that in this in that particular section, they're talking about remote viewing and about sending your consciousness beyond the boundaries of space time. It could be into the future, into the past, into parallel timelines, other dimensions, something like that, and retrieving information and bringing that back. So because it was, it was all under the same heading. OK, so that that was the impression that I got. And in terms of what we've been talking about so far, um, it seems to me that even OK, so even under Maxwell's equations, uh, that talks about electromagnetic waves. When you solve those equations for what a wave actually does, there's one solution where, you know, it goes forward in time, as you would expect. But there's another solution where it goes backwards in time. And so these are called advanced and retarded waves. Okay. Mm -hmm. So Maxwell's equations don't rule out signals being sent back in time from the future. They're they're baked into the math itself. There's nothing, there's nothing ruling it out. Uh, and so I think that's one example of information potentially breaking the space-time barrier, you know? Um, in relativity, they talk about how information cannot be sent faster than the speed of light. And so therefore, you can't really send information back in time either, because in order to go back in time, you have to break that space-time bubble. You have to go beyond light, beyond the, the space-time light bubble, uh, light cone, in order to, to send something back. But... Uh, when we're talking about scalar physics in terms of potentials, like magnetic vector potential, the, the electric scalar potential, those things are not as, um, well, the technical term would be invariant. They're not as invariant as uh, the electric or the magnetic force fields are. So if you send signals using scalar waves, they're not as bound by the laws of physics or the by the laws of determinism and regular you know, space time and relativity and so on, because they started getting a little bit more non-deterministic. There's more free will and consciousness involved there. And so therefore, if there's anything coming back in time from the future in terms of signals, it is very likely these, uh, these scalar waves rather than uh, electromagnetism or, or things like that. It's more, more likely these scalar waves are coming back in time. And for those of you that are into quantum physics and are into David Bohm and his pilot wave theory, for example, the question has always been, what are these pilot waves that guide the trajectory of the particle in like in the double slit experiment, for example? Well, I think I think the pilot wave is not only a wave that goes forward in time, but also things coming from the future. And because the future is is multiple, like there's different probable futures, you actually have multiple signals coming back from different probable futures all combining in the present. And that entire structure of this forward time and reverse time influence, this is what creates the wave function as we know it. 
you know, it's both forward time and reverse time stuff. And the actual medium, the actual, uh, yeah, the actual medium of communication that's being used there is very likely these potentials. And the reason why I say that is because in quantum physics, as I mentioned with the uh, with the uh, Aharonov Bohm experiment, it is the potentials that affect things on a quantum level. So if an electron uh, through the double slit experiment goes a little bit this way instead of that way, what is it that nudged it? What is it that nudged it? And it's very likely uh, a mix of forward or past to future and future to past scalar potential signals that are intermixing in the present, creating like an interference pattern, almost like a hologram in a way. And the particle kind of follows that trajectory if you want to use uh, Bohm's thing. So I just wanted to deviate on a uh, I time. love uh, pilot wave theory, uh, honestly. That's uh, even before I started digging into the science years mm -hmm. ago, I always thought for some reason when I heard the pilot wave theory, it just seemed to connect with me. Um, and the aronoff bohm effect as well seems like something that people should really look into. It gets repeated pretty much all the time in the science that I've been digging into. Thomas yeah. Beard mentions it many, many times as well. Yeah, one thing I want to highlight about the pilot wave theory is that mm -hmm. a lot of people say that the pilot wave theory is deterministic in the sense that when you have this field, this pilot wave, which you can calculate, when you have this pilot wave affecting a particle, the particle is being pushed on by this quantum force in, in a mathematically predictable way, which takes you know all the non-determinism out of quantum physics. So people try to say that this theory is, de is deterministic, but it actually isn't because Bohm himself in his book, he admits that this pilot wave has an extra term on it, which is like a, a random quantum fluctuation term. So as much as a pilot wave can be mathematically described, there is noise that exists in it that makes things unpredictable. And the question is, where does this noise come from? I think it comes from beyond space time, from the future, probable futures, consciousness, the soul, you know, all these things, they, they're, those are the things that add that unpredictability factor. So it's not, it's not fully deterministic. Yeah, so what do you think about time, then? Because I would almost argue what you're saying. It reminds me of uh, The True Detective, season one. Time is a flat circle. That time is not necessarily linear as we perceive it. What, what are your thoughts? Well, I do like what Sarfati said about time. I actually agree with, with a lot of what he said about retro time. Retro-causality. Right, retro-causality and the fact that intuition is like a you know the future flowing into the present, whereas memory is the, the, the past flowing into the present, like entanglement. Entanglement with future, probable futures versus entanglement with the past. I thought that was pretty insightful, and, and I agree with that. Uh, now, just in terms of time, though, I think that I think that everything that can happen in the many worlds theory, anything that could possibly happen, has already happened in a mechanical sense. So the, the analogy that I like to use is like a, like a roadmap or like a tapestry, where the entire carpet or the entire roadmap is already on paper. You know, it's already laid out. And all the roads that you could possibly take are already on the map, right? But the actual road that you will end up taking has not yet been decided. So it is actually your consciousness that is moving through a pre-existing matrix or tapestry, a roadmap of possibilities, right? So the universe as a whole has a universal wave function, which encodes all of, it, of its possible states from the very beginning of time to the very end of time. And it encodes all these possibilities. And that is the roadmap that we as consciousnesses are traversing, okay? However, we are traversing through it collectively. It's almost like you and I, we are, well, right now, obviously we are synchronized in time because otherwise we wouldn't be able to have this conversation. So mm -hmm. your consciousness and my consciousness, we are synchronized in time right now, Friday, April 19th at 8.30 PM Eastern time. So we, we can talk. Uh, what this really means is that continuously our consciousness is phase locking or entangling with all the other people that are doing it at the same time. And so we are all kind of chain ganged together, moving through this roadmap or this tapestry of possibilities into the future. And that's what creates our sense of time. Um, now, I don't, th I don't think it is you and I individually that is deciding to go, you know, second by second into the future. I think we are being carried along by uh, a kind of, I guess what Rupert Sheldrake would call a morphogenetic field, basically, basically a collective consciousness field that is binding us all together and is moving us through time the same way that water and river carries swimmers down the river, okay? So we're being moved along through time by, I guess, what the ancient Greeks would call the demiurge, you know, some sort of a universal thought form uh, construct that is propagating time on its own. And then we are just along for the ride and kind of deciding where in that time stream, you know, we want to go. The more a little bit here, a little bit there, which then affects which road intersection we'll take and, and so on. Um, it's kind of complicated, but ultimately, I think everything is consciousness. It's just a matter of uh, what rules and agreements consciousness abides by, hmm. you know? Do, yeah. 
Yeah, no, that makes sense. So would you say that opens the door to stuff like remote viewing? Do you believe remote viewing is possible? I think so. I think so because our consciousness isn't, it's only bound to the clock because we are in these bodies, which have this particular DNA, which has certain quantum properties that synchronizes us all to the same time rate, essentially. Uh, but if you if you bypass the biological brain, if you bypass the, the five senses, then you're no, you're no longer bound to uh, only perceive or interact with this current moment in space time. So that means you can project it to the future, project it to the past, to parallel timelines, to parallel possibilities. Uh, I think the only limitation really is the degree to which your consciousness can entangle with those less than real or less than uh, relevant possibilities, whether it's, it's, it's probable pasts or parallel timelines or probable futures. You see, when, when Jack Serfati talks about closed time-like curves, for example, when he talks about closed time-like curves, curves, what he's talking about, he's talking about physical time travel uh, back in time into the very same past that you came from, which then ends up leading to your same moment that you left from, right? So it's this, this closed deterministic. curve. Yeah. It, it is deterministic because as long as you stay in this loop, you have no ability to deviate from it. So you have no free will. So whatever you end up doing is a thing that you would have always done to get to that point that you left from. And that is the best that relativity has for dealing with time travel. Mm -hmm. However, if you start getting more into quantum physics instead of relativity, then you're not dealing with just determinism. You're dealing with non-determinism, which if you want to combine the two, the way that it would look is that uh, your futures aren't singular. Your futures are, are multiple, you know, like, like one point can split off into many different possibilities. So if you go through them back into the past, it's not just one loop. It's a bundle of loops that circle back on another bundle of loops that are all intersecting at this present moment. And so what that means is that if you do time travel, uh, instead of a closed time-like curve, it's more of an open space-like curve for anyone who knows what relative, you know, what space-like means in relativity. It means you're going faster than light. You're going outside uh, determinism. And uh, you're interacting with probable futures, probable pasts in a fuzzy, non-deterministic way. That is the key. What Jack talks about, he talks about deterministic closed timeline curves. And I'm talking about open space-like non-deterministic fuzzy curves. And so, it's, there's, so there's a different kinds of time travel. There's one that creates the exact same pass that you left. And then there's another that uh, involves more indirect interaction. And this is interesting because according to this math, uh, and I'm talking about this paper by Daniel Greenberg and Carl Svotil, his name was called uh, Quantum Theory Looks at Time Travel. In that paper, they kind of game out mathematically what would happen if you did have this fuzzy time travel between probable futures and probable pasts? How would that look? And what they concluded is that, uh, yes, within that entire dynamic, you could have these closed timeline curves exactly like uh, Sarfati talks about. However, you could also have fuzzy time travel where this probable future interacts with this probable past that it didn't even come from, but it's close enough that it could sort of interact. The problem is the interaction isn't 100% entanglement. It's not 100% correlation. It's not deterministic. It's non-deterministic. It's fuzzy. It's semi-correlative. And what that means is that if that time traveler comes back in time like that, they're not going to be 100% real. They're not going to be 100% tangible or physical. They might be more ethereal, like a ghost. Or they might be physical, but only, let's say, 1% of the time. So the person they're trying to interact with, maybe most of the time they miss ever being able to meet up or, you know, it, it only happens under very weird, rare circumstances. And so what does that plus the etheric ghost-like nature of it remind you of? It reminds you of a lot of UFO encounters or paranormal activity, right? It's like, it's, e it's either a person experiences something that is there but sort of ethereal you know like a shadow person or some sort of translucent form or something like that or it is physical it is tangible but it can only happen at very brief windows of time like abductions where you don't remember most of it afterwards or it can only happen in the middle of nowhere in the dead of night you know these very special conditions those two things that encompass ufology and uh, paranormal activity it's weird how the laws of fuzzy time travel imply that and mm -hmm. so I think about that a lot, you know, it's kind of, yeah. So is that, you think that's kind of equivalent to many worlds and string theory and the idea of like the Mandela effect. Is that kind of where your thought process is going then? Where um, even, people don't know Mandela effect is the idea that like, yeah. sometimes we can retroactively change the past and then we have like false memories of what things used to be. Well, the thing about retro retro causality is that it's not, it's not always necessary to change the past that we remember. 
Hmm. Sometimes it's only necessary to select the past that we never remembered or never experienced. And what do I mean by this? For example, um, let's say that you're driving, you drive over a pothole and it bends the axle on your car and all of a sudden you need a thousand dollars to get it fixed, but you don't have the money. Okay. So theoretical example. So you need to get your car fixed ASAP. Uh, you need a thousand dollars. You don't know where it's going to come from. And, uh, but you have some sort of wish or inkling or intuition that it's going to, it's going to come like in a magical way. And what do you know? Three days later, in the mail, you get a check for $1,100 from some class action lawsuit you don't even remember being part of that ends up paying to get your axle repaired. But the thing is, if you trace back when that letter got mailed, it got mailed the prior week. So it got mailed before you even drove over the pothole that bent your axle that you need the money for. It's very strange. And so what some people can conclude, therefore, is that the past was somehow changed or selected when you needed it, when you got the accident and you needed that money. The past was somehow influenced to create that check that came in the mail three days later. Hmm. Okay. And, and, and that's a form of retro causality, but it's not really retro causality. What it might simply be is that the past was open. There were many different probable pasts that could have led to that present moment. You know, in one past, there was a class action lawsuit. Another one, there wasn't another one. It was only $500, right? Another one was only a hundred dollars. You don't know. You, you don't know anything about these lawsuits. So as far as you're concerned, all of these different probable past timelines, I mean, they could have all coexisted. Just like in the double slit experiment where you don't look at it and all of a sudden the two electrons going through the two different paths, they interfere with each other because they both exist simultaneously. As long as you're not observing, as long as you're not remembering, as long as you're not interacting with it, it's open, it's fluid, it's quantum selectable, right? So there are aspects of our past that are still open, still quantum selectable because we never observed them. We didn't even know about them. So there are these open areas that if right now in the present you needed something selected or changed in the past well you know what no big deal because you're selecting past number 155 instead of 156 and 155 is the one that leads to you getting that check three days later right mm -hmm. so what i'm saying is you know it's not always that you're you're traveling back in time and changing things physically sometimes it's simply a matter of selecting what still has not yet been measured or observed even if it happened a year ago a thousand years ago whatever you know it can lead to synchronicities like this or manifestings like this or i think if the process goes wrong you know yeah sure it could lead to something like the mandela effect where you got these two groups of people each one with a lot of collective consciousness powers all right but they're tugging on the past in different ways you know maybe one is berenstein bears another one was bernstein bears so but now they exist in the same collective reality and uh, unfortunately they're both still entangled with different pasts and so they have different memories, just like what Jack talks about with memory being entanglement with the past. But what if it's yeah. entanglement with alternate pasts? Then you're going to get alternate memories. I mean, I think that's what it comes down to. Yeah, I mean, for me, it's fruit of the loom. There was definitely a cornucopia. I will fight anybody out there and prove that that <laughs> cornucopia existed. But um, no, so this is a good segue into the conversation I want to talk about the nature of the UFO phenomenon. And I'm going to be very straightforward about this. And I'm just going to preface it with that. Um, Joe Rogan and, and Tucker Carlson were talking about this today. And uh, Tucker Carlson had this belief that the phenomenon might have a spiritual nature. I think that based on what you just said regarding retro causality, various timelines, if you want to think of it like that, and these loops, I could absolutely see this connection between that and ghosts and extra dimensional beings, whatever they want to say. Uh, I think that there's also this idea that um, aliens could be visiting us from far away if we have faster than light kind of uh, travel that's mm -hmm. possible, especially manipulating gravity and gravity waves. And then I think the other uh, theory that in my mind at least has a lot of prominence is this ultra terrestrial hypothesis uh, or cryptids, you know, that they come from the water, or they come from underground. What is, or the other th uh, theory based on what we were talking about retro causality is that it's future us communicating mm -hmm. to the past as well. And then we are giving ourselves information about how our civilization is going to advance. What is your thoughts on those theories? Is there anyone you like the most? Do you think it's a mixture potentially? What do you think is going on with non-human intelligence? Well, the first thing that I need to bring up here is that if we are dealing with time travelers from the future, then we would be dealing with probable time travelers from probable futures rather than just one time traveling group mm -hmm. from one future. And the reason why I bring that up is because uh, it's, it's, it's very easy. Like, let's say that they are psychopathic manipulators they're liars they're, they're, they're deceivers then it's easy very easy for them to say that we are your future so essentially you have no free will and you will become us because it has to be that way because we're here right now and according to the, to the laws of relativity and closed timeline curves you must create the future that we come from and that's why we are here and that's a that's a tricky way of kind of uh, uh sidestepping the free will issue 
right? If you get people to believe that they have no free will. But if you believe in in, in open open space like curves, then there are probable futures. And then, you know, then what you're potentially talking about is a time war between time traveling factions from different loops, from different from different uh, curves. Uh, and in that case, yeah, I mean, we then the future is open. And that would that would probably explain why within the abduction phenomenon, contactees, ufology, uh, even in the disclosure process, there seem to be different agendas at, at work that are opposed to each other that are, I mean, from what I can tell, and this is just based on me interacting with tons of experiencers and doing a lot of research, right? It's, uh, I, I know, I know like people that are more into the nuts and bolts aspect of it, they might find this kind of ludicrous, but I'm, I'm going based on, based off of detective work, working with very weak signals, trying to trace, you know, filter out signal from noise and so on. I do detect that there are different agendas at play. Uh, some of them that are more pro humanity and some of them that are anti humanity. And so the disclosure process, it's not just about revealing the truth about UFOs. It's also about revealing the truth about what these things actually are. Uh, not only that, but also what agendas there might be. So what motives? Because, you know, it's kind of tempting to treat it all as uh, the phenomenon, as if it's like a, a space nebula that we don't fully understand. I mean, it's not that. It's, it's actual sentient beings that appear to have intelligence and motives uh, and agendas and a very, very far ranging political uh strategies about how to massage humanity in the direction that they want it to go right uh, and so we we always have to look beyond the scientific towards the more um detective way of looking at this you know so-called phenomenon that because you know it's not it's not just about it's not just about matter and energy and and and, and how their propulsion works it's also about what their motives are and what they ultimately have in store for us and unfortunately um things like the nimitz incident or MH370, things like that, um, those only only start to step up to the to the realm of motivation. But if you really want to look into actual motivation, you do have to go more into the abduction field, for example, contactee field, uh, to look at not only what they say, but to read between the lines of what they say in case what they say is deception. You know, so uh, now regarding the ultra terrestrial hypothesis, I think that's a big part of it because they do have um, uh, hyper hyper physics at their disposal bending space time and doing all this crazy, crazy maneuvers and so on and being invisible, being able to levitate an, an abductee out on a blue beam through a closed window. I mean, that's been reported hundreds of times. So they have these technologies that border on uh, what we would call occult. Now, unfortunately, some people want to call it uh, a spiritual factor. Like I know, I think Jacques Vallée and some others, they, they talk about the spiritual component to the UFO phenomenon. And that's an unfortunate choice of words because spiritual implies almost like religious, you know, like like more ethically advanced, but that's not always the case. So that's why I prefer uh, paraphysical or occult because occult could mean demonic, you know, it could mean psychopathic, it could mean just pure psychic power without the ethics or the integrity or the spiritual evolution that, that comes with it, which is possible. I mean, because there's black magicians, there's people who engage in psychic vampirism practices, you know, all within the umbrella of occultism. And, uh, you know, interestingly enough, some of these reports of interactions with aliens during abductions, they also have psychic vampirism component, you know, sadistic, um, sadistic experiences that these beings are doing to people as if to feed on their suffering in some weird way. It's that's like the more uh, fringe aspect of an already fringe topic. But I did want to touch on that. So I'm, what I'm saying is, you know, it's a big multidimensional phenomenon, uh, but it's more than just a phenomenon. It's possibly uh, a very far ranging, complicated agenda that we have to look into as if we were detectives trying to detect a, a motive. Interesting. So do you think that it's possible there are aliens visiting us like physical little green men coming from somewhere else? Do you yeah. Think yeah. I mean, yeah. And, and the only way to really get at that is to look at as much anecdotal data as you possibly can. Now, you know, anecdotal data, it gets a bad rap in science because it's not reliable. However, however, we are not dealing with a, with an inert phenomenon that can be, put in a controlled setting. We're dealing with an intelligent phenomenon that has its own motives and that does not necessarily want to be discovered, right? So the, the typical scientific method of only looking at, you know, ground traces and chemical analyses and metal analyses, that's not enough to unravel the, the nature of what's going on. So therefore you do have to look at anecdotal data in order to discern motives, just like a detective does. I mean, a, detec a detective relies upon forensics, but it also relies upon uh, witness testimony and putting pieces together, the timing of things, the motives, you know, uh, try, trying to build a case to, to solve to solve a crime. Uh, and the same thing with this phenomenon as well, where 
it does appear that we do have biological and non-physical, non-biological beings that are non-human, that are intelligent, that are more intelligent than us, and that have uh, super uh, hyper-physical technology at their disposal. And, you know, it's kind of intimidating, but when you look at things like the Kona Blue document, for example, where whoever wrote that, they, they believe in that. They believe it's worth getting money from Congress to investigate it, right? So these are, these are not just crackpots. These are people playing with millions and millions of dollars. They believe in it. They have the expertise. So if they, if they do, then uh, I don't see anything wrong with uh, people like us believing that too. So then in just a couple sentences, which of those hypotheses do you think is the one you lean on the most? Or do you think it's really just a combination of all of them? I think that a lot of these possibilities are not mutually exclusive, where it's mm -hmm. very possible that you can have a biological race of non-human entities that come from another star system um, that have extra dimensional abilities and that could possibly also be here from the future, right? So a future extra dimensional other star system that are here now in this dimension, in this time, on this planet. Um, now, of course, when you, when you look at the actual abduction cases, it's interesting that so many of these beings are humanoid and that some of them seem to be able to be hybridized with humans, meaning that they have DNA, uh, which clearly tells me that whatever they are, if they do come from other planets, it doesn't mean that they naturally evolved there on their own. It's, it's, it's more like either Earth and them were seeded separately, but by a by common progenitor race, or they came from us or vice versa. There's some sort of relation there. And, uh, and so if, if they want to show up one day, and if they want to say that, hey, you know, we've been observing your planet for a century and we discovered humanity for the first time, I call BS on that. Because if they did, they wouldn't be humanoid. They wouldn't have two eyes and two nostrils and a mouth. You know, they wouldn't have four, four limbs. Uh, so whatever they say, I would say don't trust it and always look between the lines at the potential ulter ulterior motives. You know, quay bono, like who, whom does it benefit? That's what you have mm -hmm. to look at with all of it. Makes sense. I think I'm going to go. My, my new theory now, based on what you just said, is I like the future extra dimensional mantids. Those are going to be my, that's my new <laughs> that I like. Yeah, but that's, that's where things are pointing, unfortunately. <laughs> um, so I think the last question I want to ask you is, uh, and I appreciate your time here today. I think this has been an amazing conversation. I'd love to talk to you again in the future. But why do you think the government's covering this up? Like, what is, if you had to give your top reason, mm -hmm. I know there's probably many reasons, but, you know, I think about it and I think about the idea of all the different, um, you know, ways that there could be non-human intelligence. I wonder, why would the government cover any of this up? What do you think the government, or do you think it's not related to that at all? What do you, why do you think the government's, you know, hiding this mm -hmm. information from us? Well, you know, just as a preface to that, it's interesting that the entities themselves are not interested in disclosing themselves as, as much as we want them to, you know? So it's, it's, each of them seems to have their own motive for why they want to keep the majority of humanity in the dark for now, you know? But at the same time, there is a very steady drip feed of disclosure, which I mean, I guess it's accelerating lately because, I mean, I think the Kona Blue document, it seems like a leak or it seems like a declassification, but mm -hmm. the timing of it is too weird. I think uh, I think it was intentional. I think it was a long ranging intentional plan to to release information like that in a deniable way, because, you know, according to the information I read about it, that the Kona Blue program, uh, it never got off the ground. It was proposed after the end of the ATIP program. You know, so it was, it was about to end. They're going to lose their funding. And now they're proposing to continue it under the Department of Homeland Security under Kona Blue in order to kind of expand their operations and, you know, set up uh, experimental labs in Skinwalker Ranch, for example, and things that Lou Elizondo had, had talked about. Um, so I think I think that document, because it didn't actually lead to anything and it was unclassified, now it's out there. People are discussing it. People are realizing that these topics are being taken seriously by actual government and military personnel, you know. Um, but because it didn't go anywhere, that's why it could be released. See, if it had succeeded, then we wouldn't even be hearing about it now because it would still be it would still be fully classified, right? But yeah, so it was, it was only a proposal and uh, it didn't reveal too much and some parts of it are, are redacted, so that's fine. But what I'm trying to say is, I think I think the reason why disclosure has been um, managed or prevented or delayed is just because our system, well, okay, so there's benevolent and malevolent reasons. The malevolent reasons includes just like what I mentioned earlier about the military industrial complex uh, getting rich off of secret technology that they've recovered. Like hiding free energy. Yeah, yeah, hiding like hiding it, uh, you know, advanced materials that they've reverse engineered and they're using for their own purposes. And a lot of times they launder it through 
uh, existing corporations. So, you know, we might hear about, oh, is this a new computer chip technology that's coming out that's going to solve Moore's law is going to allow us to get faster and faster chips. And the company that created it is going to get billions and millions of dollars in revenue because, you know, they're at the leading edge of it. Well, little do we know that technology actually comes from one of these special access programs that, you know, handed it off, laundered it through someone else and made it appear as if it was just like a, like a genuine human invention. When in reality, it was uh, siphoned off of these black projects, and they make a lot of money that way. I think. I think uh, a lot of technology, a lot of people getting rich off stuff, is a uh, probably alien technology that has been reverse engineered and has been laundered through the plausible, deniable uh, pathway of just you know corporate research or or you know the University of Tel Aviv comes up with some new um, artificial telepathy means or something like that, right? It's it's all laundered through different different areas. So I think that's part of it, um, just, you know, the vested interest in keeping this asymmetric advantage for themselves. That's one. And then the benevolent reason, in a way, I think is because our society from top to bottom, whether we're talking religion, social structure, social contract, you know, politics, technology, university, everything, so much of it is built on a lie. It's built on lies upon lies upon false assumptions. You know, like, you know, like the, like the scalar physics stuff, which got ignored. If you have disclosure, you're going to have scalar physics because that is a component of the technology beyond, you know, which these black programs are working with. So if you disclose aliens, if you disclose some of these black projects, that technology is going to get out. And the ramifications of that under the current state of the world is very difficult to deal with um, because free energy alone, it can lead to, let's say, uh, tanks with energy weapons that never run out of fuel and never run out of ammo. Can you imagine the intensity of war that could result as a result of free energy being used just for that. Or we talk about, for example, uh, totalitarian police state stuff where you could have drones, including humanoid drones that are that build themselves and multiply and never run out of energy and can be always in the skies 24 seven, circling ahead, monitoring the population below. That's possible with free energy batteries, essentially these energy power units. So whether it's totalitarianism, World War III, the, annihil the annihilation of humanity, those things are possibilities so long as we have uh, a multipolar world where, you know, countries are fighting countries over this or that, you know, ideological reasons or whatever. If you, if you take all that, 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 that tinder and you pour the fuel of free energy onto it, you could get a massive explosion. Uh, so unfortunately, as, as much as I hate to say it, if humanity wants to have widespread free energy and certain other technologies... I'm not sure if it's possible without a, a some sort of a, a hopefully benevolent one world government. Hmm. As much as I'm against globalism and things like that, I don't I don't see another way, unfortunately, because it, all it takes is one rogue nation with a, a free energy over unity bomb or you know a device that that has more energy output that probably could destroy an entire planet. And maybe that's happened in the past. You know, there are many myths about sky beings come from another another world that blew itself up. <laughs> Or, you know that just that destroyed itself so well you yeah. hit my last question there that was exactly what i was going to ask you is whether or not you think we could destroy our own planet with this i personally think we absolutely could i, mm -hmm. I look at this technology and yeah. you even brought up a few new things that i'm going to be thinking about in terms of terminator situations and matrix of self-replicating machines that are creating a fascist uh monitored world but so um, Tom, I, I really love the conversation that we had here today, man. I thank you very much for it. Um, couldn't be more grateful. I uh, would love to talk with you again in the future. Uh, in the last couple of minutes, do you want to plug? Uh, I know you have a few books that are out there. Do you want to plug any content, any books for the people who are watching right now? Yeah. So if you go to my website, montalk.net, M-O-N-T-A-L-K.net. If you go there, if you click on books, for example, you've got links to free books. I've got my Fringe Knowledge book for beginners. Okay, Fringe Knowledge for Beginners. That's awesome. It's like a 125-page introduction to spirituality, conspiracy, alienology, time wars, you know, consciousness powers. So that's free on there. You can get that. You can get my other book, Discerning Alien Disinformation, which is the, the most distilled bottom line picture that I can muster about what the alien agenda actually is. Okay, so you can get that also for free. And then my latest book from 2022 is called Gnosis. And it's about... It's essentially what happens if you take quantum physics and ufology and uh, that entire sphere and you look at religion and mythology and ancient history through that lens. It, when you do that, you start realizing that so much of ancient history and ancient religion involves competing alien agendas, possible time wars, and the use of advanced technologies. For example, the Ark of the Covenant, 
you know, we all know that there's something very interesting with that. Um, but I explain in the book how the physics works behind that and what the ultimate implications are for our time today and uh, especially going into the future. So it's a, it's a mind blowing book. And that one, unfortunately, I don't have it for free because God, it took so much work to put that thing together. Um, but it's on Amazon and you can get it on Kindle as well. And, uh, you know, an EPUB format and so on. So yeah, check those out if you like. And uh, hopefully you enjoy some articles on my site and, and uh, check out my YouTube channel as well. I've got lots more videos there. Yeah, and we'll uh, make sure I try to put that into the description as well. And, and Tom's available on Twitter as well at, or X, I guess it is now, at Tom Montauk. So thank you again, once again, uh, Tom Montauk. Excellent conversation. Hope everybody enjoyed it. Have a good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you very much.